Someone asked me for my opinion on Don Lincoln's debunking of the acceleration explanation of the twin paradox. I'm hoping that this analysis might be of interest to those who follow me. I discuss some aspects of relativity in the context of the critique, so the following is not just a critique of Don's YouTube video, but an illustration of my own thought process for what it is worth. Up to about 1 minute 40, I liked much of what he said, including that most people get time dilation wrong, and he showed what looked like a diagram emphasizing the entanglement of time and space and the relativity of simultaneity, which are the real key to this paradox, along with some understanding of the kinematics of acceleration in special relativity. At about 1 minute 35, he said, moving clocks tick more slowly. This is misleading, just like a piece of wood does not have an absolute length, but rather it has a length in each frame. A clock does not have an absolute rate of ticking. OK, they do have their rest values, but this is specifically the value measured in a co-moving inertial reference frame. So it is a choice of specific frame, not the establishment of a frame-free value. While Don might argue that this is what he meant, in my experience, people often misconstrue this type of loose language and think that something much more absolute has been said. They think that this statement means that objectively fast-moving clocks tick more slowly. Keep in mind, when two inertial observers move with respect to each other, they each see the other as going slowly. There is thus no objective sense in which we can say that one has the slow clock, and it is this point that is usually hard for people to get. While some people object to time dilation in any form, those who accept it often believe that it just means that clocks tick at different rates but that there could be an absolute scale of time with respect to which these clocks can be said to be going slower or faster. Moving along to 306, by now he has given a description of the twin paradox that smuggles in an implicit feeling that because the travelling twin is moving at high speed, they experience less overall time. He also invokes the spirit of Einstein to claim legitimacy for his following thought experiment. Well, for me, Don is on the right track next when he speaks about something that breaks the symmetry and that thing might be acceleration. He then overstates the position by claiming that the acceleration view insists that time dilation occurs during the acceleration. Such a suggestion is not part of the generic view that acceleration is the key. The basic correct argument is, in simplistic terms, that the time taken in relative travel sets up a condition between the two frames so that the result of the acceleration is to produce a time displacement between them. I would be loath to refer to that process as time dilation. Don, in a section starting at 2.25, states that the acceleration explanation is totally wrong, but has actually attacked a straw man. Also, he follows this up with one of his classic moves of trying to psychologically bargain by saying effectively that many reasonable people have got hold of this explanation and that they should not feel bad. Many physicists who don't work with relativity believe the same thing. He's saying that if you're wrong, then you're in the company of many physicists. For me, by 3.02, Don has definitely left the path of wisdom and taken up selling encyclopedias door to door. Regardless of what he says next, I do not like that he is clearly using psychological tactics to win the audience over. I much prefer that what is said holds up to rational examination rather than to be emotionally appealing. At around 3.25, he claims we can think of the Earth as stationary because that is what special relativity tells us. While this is not important for the overall discussion, it is a technical error. The Earth is going around the Sun, around the Sun, and that means it is accelerating and it is not an inertial frame. Special relativity only says that an inertial frame can be thought of as stationary and most frames are not inertial. Next, he says he will get time displacement on return from a situation in which there is no acceleration. Keep in mind that I said earlier that the key issue is the way in which the changes of inertial frames are chosen. The claim of the acceleration approach is that the physical acceleration is the physical cause of the way in which the inertial co-moving frames are changing. 
It is not correct to say that the acceleration in the relative sense is the cause, only that it is associated with the physics of this phenomenon. Around 6.13, there is a point that might just be me objecting to the details of the phrasing, but yes, I think these details can be important indicators of what is on the expositor's mind. Don says that the separation of P1 to P2 is L and P2 to P3 is L, but in whose reference frame? Recall that distances are not absolute. To state a distance, you need to say who is measuring it. By 6.43, it seems that what he meant is in the frame of observer A. He also refers, in a cavalier manner, to B and C moving. What he should say is that they move in the frame of observer A. Sometimes this point is pedantry, but sometimes it can be vitally important to the whole exercise. I will give the benefit of the doubt and assume that it is intended that frame A is inertial and that in frame A, observer B and observer C are moving at constant velocity and so according to special relativity will also be inertial. At 7.32, Don states, moving people really do experience a shorter amount of time than a stationary one. This is clearly a total contradiction of the idea of relativity of velocity, since as Don himself stated, each inertial person is allowed to consider themselves as stationary. By 8.10, Don has committed a cardinal sin. He added times that were observed in two distinct inertial reference frames. While this might sometimes lead to a correct conclusion, the method is not correct. He is adding apples to oranges. All he has is the time experienced by B plus the time experienced by C. He claims to have the round-trip time experienced by some observer, but he does not have a round-trip time as experienced by anyone at all. Well, technically he does have the time experienced by the non-existent accelerating observer, but this is more or less an accident. Don implies that this shows what the time difference is on return, but that time difference depends on the details of how A's clock is matched to the accelerating frame, which he has ignored. And if this exercise is done from the point of view of B, then A would experience less time. Something is missing. Expanding on some of the details of what went wrong should help. Don suggests that there are three events, start, middle and end. But these are not events. Events are points in space-time, that is, a given place at a given time. They have no spatial extent or temporal duration. The experiment starting, at least in the way that Don describes it, is not an event, as it is distributed over space-time. As a partial example of the issue, observers C would measure that observer B leaves P1 at a different time to observer C passing P3, while observer A says that C at P3 and B at P1 occurred at the same time. Observer B feels that C started earlier and observer C feels that B started earlier. The point of view of observer A is at odds with both the other observers. Also, B and C would both claim that the distance between the points is less than L. Here they would both agree on L on gamma, but they would disagree with observer A. The actual list of relevant events seems to be as follows. 1. Observer C at P3. 2. Observer B at P1. 3. Observers B and C at P2. 4. Observer C at P1. 5. Observer B at P3. None of this is certain to negate what Don is about to say, but when I first watched the video it worried me that he is ignoring all this and treating the frame of observer A as being absolute. It could just be a turn of phrase, but it is one that can easily lead to errors, and the latter turned out to be the case. It turns out that Don is a moving target himself. In preparing this video, after making notes on Don's, I find that Don's video seems to have changed a bit in response to comments. He deleted some of it and added a lengthy acknowledgement that acceleration is involved, but continues to claim that it is not important. The math as originally done by Don was an attempt to make it sound like it all meant something. It is another psychological technique, like Reader's Digest competitions, that involve a complicated process of moving stickers around. It is the sunk cost fallacy. 
Now that you have done the math, what comes next must be worth something or you just wasted your time. But the remaining argument is bait and switch. Yes, observer A sees C's clock and B's clock as going slow. But observer C and B see observer A's clock as going slow. So from C's point of view, the time change on A's clock is smaller than on C's. There is no breaking of symmetry. A and C do not agree that C had less time. C says that A had less time, at least if you ignore the moment of acceleration. Don's conclusion that the moving person's duration is smaller than the stationary person's duration is essentially wrong. It is based on the false idea that there was something absolute about observer A's frame. Also, the idea of adding the outward and inward times is invalid. Don has started to talk about these times as though they were experienced by a single inertial observer, but for this to be experienced by a single observer, that observer would have to jump ships in mid-trip, requiring a change in velocity of v to minus v in the time it takes for the two ships to pass in the night. That is called acceleration. You cannot claim that something is not accelerating by referring to a collection of still images. Part of the correct resolution of the paradox is that the impulse of acceleration causes a step change in the relation between A's clock and C's clock. The details are outside the scope of this critique of Don Lincoln. Without that acceleration, there are two different observers and the conclusion about the aging of the single individual is not justified. Don acknowledges that he is talking about two frames but fails to acknowledge that this means his conclusion is incorrect. He is adding apples and oranges. Without acceleration, adding up times like this has little meaning. Don's voice is very soothing. It makes you want to believe and he is good at using wording that emphasizes this and he is constantly reassuring you that he has shown you the truth. Very matter of fact he is. But keep in mind, observer C says that the time between the two events for observer A is less than that for observer C and so does B. Hence, adding up the total time that C thinks A has experienced and the total time that B thinks A has experienced, the conclusion is that A has experienced less time. This is the paradox. And hence the matter is not resolved. Acceleration is required. Don Lincoln's acceleration is a straw man. In this discussion, I have not attempted to resolve the paradox. My goal was to critique the exposition of Don. Finally, breaking the fourth wall. I hope that you like this discussion and would like to hear more. To facilitate this, like a street performer, I now pass the hat around. Please like, subscribe and share this video with your friends or your enemies if you feel that way inclined. This will give me the opportunity to produce more of these. And if you feel that anything was unclear or incorrect or you want to know my opinion on some detail or other, please leave a comment to that effect. Thank you.